When in the closing chapter of the accumulation of capital, Luxembourg introduces militarist production as the only sphere of accumulation that appears viably without limits and brings Marx's diagrams back into use in her analysis, this must be understood as an historical realization of the place of the diagrams in a capitalist totality. It's worth quoting her at some great length. All other attempts to expand markets and set up operational bases for capital largely depend on historical, social, and political factors beyond the control of capital, whereas production for militarism represents a province whose regular and progressive expansions seems primarily determined by capital itself. In this way, capital turns historical necessity into a virtue. The ever fiercer competition in the capitalist world itself provides a field for accumulation of the first magnitude. Capital increasingly employs militarism for implementing a foreign and colonial policy to get hold of the means of production and labor power of non-capitalist countries and societies. This same militarism works in a like manner in the capitalist countries to divert purchasing power away from the non-capitalist strata. The representatives of simple commodity production and the working class are affected alike in this way. At their expense, the accumulation of capital is raised to the highest power by robbing, robbing the one of their productive forces and depressing the other's standard of living. I have more of the quote, but I'll, I'll leave it, as you probably have all read it. Uh, I'll return to the details of this passage before long, but for now I'd like to shift attention first to the theoretical and second to the practical historical conditioning of Luxembourg's proposed solution to the problem of accumulation. Much of the groundwork for the final section of Luxembourg's volume on accumulation is laid in her research on the dissolution of primitive communism undergone during the decade preceding the publication of the accumulation book. Two texts are of chief concern here, one titled by the Anglophone editors of the Luxembourg Reader, The Dissolution of Primitive Communism, and the second drawn from the same reader entitled Slavery. In the latter text, Luxembourg draws attention to the uniqueness of slavery as the oldest form of class domination and economic exploitation. Engels argues in his Antiduring that following the establishment of private property, war supplied an enchained workforce to meet the new demand for foreign labor. Luxembourg finds this insufficient. Since slavery came subsequent to primitive communism, what she calls the mark, it is there its conditions must be found, rather than in the private property form. As Luxembourg demonstrates with reference to the Inca Empire and also to ancient Greece, prior to private property, exploitation and servitude had resulted from the conquest of one mark community by another. The grafting of a foreign mark onto another allows for and creates a relationship of exploitation and servitude toward the outside, preserved by the dominant Marx military aristocracy. Thus, slavery and private property come together with the growing militaristic dissolution of primitive communism, though slavery itself begins as a mode of subjugating the conquered laborer to a state of communal property. In the text on the dissolution of primitive communism, Luxembourg elaborates on the preconditions of slavery and the emergence of military apparatuses. For her, the domination of one mark by another demonstrates that primitive communism is only based on solidarity within the membership of the mark. War functions as a method of solving conflicts of interest between social communities, while the military apparatus itself emerges from the imperative to establish exploitation as a permanent structure. On the one hand, war is a method of overcoming limits to production by economic exploitation and subjugation. On the other, those modes of production that persistently require overcoming their own limits develop a military aristocracy by means of which war may become permanent. It is the demands of intersocial trade upon the militarily exploitative community that pulls slavery as a private property form into being, as in Greece. In the Americas, it is Spanish colonialism that introduces the debt systems, coerced labor, land grabbing and taxation that collapse the indigenous Mark communities, even those dependent upon the military exploitation of Marks. European colonialism represents the highest achievement of militarism up to that point by introducing the phenomena of expropriating the means of production of other societies, completing the collapse of those societies, and subjugating the former members of those societies to a new one in which their alternatives are enslavement or extermination. Altogether, Luxembourg's slavery and the, prim and the dissolution of primitive communism puts the accent on militarism rather than private property as the mode of production's lever on the increasing systematization of exploitation. As she phrases it in the accumulation of capital, 
political power is nothing but a vehicle for the economic process. Turning now to the practical historical conditions of Luxembourg's the accumulation of capital, let's consider her participation in the 1907 Stuttgart Cong Congress of the Second International. Going too fast still, okay. At this Congress, a colonial commission was appointed that drafted a majority report highlighting the so-called positive sides of colonialism. Though the resolution was defeated by a slim margin, it was made clear that half of those organized more or less endorsed imperialist, imperialist ideology. An anti-militarist commission crafted a new resolution, the first draft of which established militarism as an extension of capitalism. This first draft, as Lenin wrote on the matter, failed to indi indicate the active tasks of the proletariat and thereby permitted it to be viewed through an opportunistic lens. Uh, George Heinrich Vollmar put, the uh, put forward just this lens by determining that parliamentary struggle ought to be the exclusive mode of resistance. Luxembourg, unsurprisingly, submitted the following counterproposal. In the event of a threat of war, it is the duty of the workers and their parliamentary representatives in the countries involved to do everything possible to prevent the outbreak of war by taking suitable measures, which can of course change or be intensified in accordance with the intensification of the class struggle and the general political situation. In the event of war breaking out nevertheless, it is their duty to take measures to bring it to an end as quickly as possible and to utilize the economic and political crisis brought about by the war to arouse the masses of the people and accelerate the overthrow of capitalist rule. This resolution passed. Um, so, you know, as we know, uh, opportunist elements of the Second International uh, nearly secured a victory at this Congress. Nonetheless, in uh, 1911, the, of, uh, the official handbook for German socialist voters still maintains the notion that a world war would be, in all probability, the last war. When that summer, German imperialists nearly brought on the war by sending the warship the Panther to Agadir, Morocco, an international socialist meeting in London declared European labor delegates prepared to oppose a declaration of war by any means necessary. A year later, in September, on the floor of the German Reichstag, the Social Democratic deputy represented the refusal of the masses to be instruments of war profiteering. And the International Peace Congress in November, allegiance to the international was maintained as the moral force against the war, with all willingness to make any necessary sacrifice to the socialist struggle. Returning to the long quote above, the uniqueness of the providence of militarist production should be clear. If militarism is most significantly a motor of economic expansion and a destroyer of the limits posed by non-capitalist social organization, then it is also necessarily the site of capitalism's purest reproductive form. Insofar as imperialism on the one hand robs simple commodity producers of their means of production and the other depresses the proletariat's quality of life, it gives birth to capitalism's grave on two counts. On the one hand, imperialism progressively destroys the basis of capital's apparently limitless expansion outside of itself, and on the other, it creates the conditions of possibility for its internally productive classes coming to consciousness of their fate within the totality. Consequently, Luxembourg's conclusion points to the necessary resolution of these two sides in socialist revolution. The historical crisis of German social democracy indicates precisely this. To quote from the Junius pamphlet, uh, the real problem that the World War has placed before the socialist parties, upon whose solution the future of the working class movement depends, is the readiness of the proletarian mass to act in the fight against imperialism. The international proletariat suffers not from a dearth of postulates, programs, and slogans, but from a lack of deeds, of effective resistance, of the power to attack imperialism at the decisive moment, just in times of war. It has been unable to put its old slogan, war against war, into actual practice. Here is the Gordian knot of the proletarian movement and of its future. Luxembourg refuses to accept that the failure to stop the war is a consequence of a failure of the leadership of the proletariat. I mean, it is in a certain way, but social democracy's flagging readiness to continue class war against world war uh, indicates that the consciousness of the proletarian mass seemingly had not caught up with the imperialist reality of capitalism. This was not only a failure to recognize the consequences of imperialism for its own class, 
but also a failure to recognize the destructive realities of imperialism for non-capitalist social strata at home and abroad. It is in this recognition of, historicalness, of the historically necessary alliance that the Bolshevik Revolution triumphs. In her text on the Russian Revolution, Luxembourg again invokes the classical image of the Gordian knot, but this time as cut by the conquest of power of the workers and peasants in alliance against imperialist war and for the equitable redistribution of the land. On the question of land, we must side with Luxembourg against Lenin and his spokesperson Lukács. Luxembourg acknowledges the tactical excellence of the Bolshevik seizure and distribution of the land, but criticizes uh, it strategically, arguing that this move cannot lead to socialist agriculture on several counts. First, the new socialist economy depends upon the largest estates as the most advanced method of agricultural production, but most importantly, the second, that this immediate seizure and distribution establishes the relatively unassailable barricade of a, quote, new form of private property in the form of medium and small estates, increasing rather than eliminating class antagonisms among the peasants by creating a newly developed and powerful mass of owning peasants who will defend their newly won property with tooth and nail against every socialist attack. To this argument, Lukács responds that Luxembourg does not see the significance of the participation of non-proletarians, and especially peasants, because she overestimates the organic, so-called spontaneous forces of the revolution while underestimating the significance of the party. On the contrary, what we must now demonstrate is that the matter of spontaneity vis-a-vis -vis socialist revolution is precisely a question of the socialist revolutionary consciousness of the masses. On this subject, it's necessary to make a detour through the theory of two of the foremost anti-imperialist dialectical materialists of the 20th century, Mao Zedong and Amy Césaire. Let's begin with the classic essay on contradiction. The overarching reminder here is that the universal dimension of a given contradiction resides in its particularity. Satung elaborates this by introducing the notions of principal contradiction and the principal aspect of the contradiction. In the case of capitalist society, the principal contradiction is the relationship between labor and capital. But in a colonial or semi-colonial society, the principal contradiction may shift. When the nation is united against imperialism, the principal contradiction is between the colonizers and the colonized. But in conditions of neocolonialism, wherein the capitalists are in alliance with an indigenous ruling class, the principal contradiction is between the indigenous masses and rulers. The principal aspect in any case is the dominant and therefore determining side of a given contradiction, while the overturning of a given contradiction produces a qualitatively new contradiction by means of the determinations of the newly ascended principal aspect. In these terms, we would defend Luxembourg against Lukács by arguing that the tactical success but strategic failure of Bolshevik land policy is not an underestimation of the, of the non-proletarian participation in the revolution, but quite the contrary, the failure to resolve the contradiction between socialist industry and agriculture into principality by allowing the principal contradiction between feudal landlords and peasants to resolve into a new, more complex and distributed contradiction between the medium estate owning peasant capitalists and the small estate owning peasants. In Paul Maddox's essay, Luxembourg versus Lenin, he terms this the capitalization of agriculture. Put differently, Luxembourg does not fail to see the significance of the party, but rather appropriately estimates the significance of, contradiction, of the contradictions of Russian agriculture, agricultural society for Russian socialism as a whole. It's to Amy Césaire's 1956 resignation from the uh, French Communist Party that I turn to next as the fundamental text of anti-imperialist socialist theory on the question of consciousness. Césaire was the author of both the masterpiece of modernist African diasporic poetry titled Na Notebook of a Return to the Native Land and the classic of anti-imperialist anti literature Discourse on Colonialism. He also taught Franz Fanon and was a communist politician of note in his indigenous Martinique. As Césaire writes in his resignation letter to Maurice Thoreau's, people of color in their struggles against colonial powers have come to grasp in their consciousness the full breadth of their singularity and are ready to assume on all levels and in all areas the responsibilities that flow from this coming to consciousness, asserting that in their uh, then their anti-racist struggle their, and anti-colonial struggle, the historical consciousness and practice cannot be relegated outside the principal contradiction as it had in communist ideology. 
Césaire's resignation reminds us then and now of the consequences of segregating particulars and universals by asserting a need to think their mediation, according to which, uh, yeah, according to which he considered it our duty to combine our efforts with those of all men with a compassion for justice and truth in order to build organizations susceptible of honesty and effectively helping black peoples in their struggle for today and for tomorrow, in order to build organizations capable of preparing them to operate in, a, in, a, in an autonomous manner. The question concerns the proper mediation with socialist revolutionary consciousness. In rural peasant societies, this is again quoting Césaire, uh, in which the working class is tiny and the middle classes have a political importance out of which uh, or out of proportion, is effective action by communist organizations acting in isolation possible. In the anti-imperialist context, Césaire proposes that Marxists ought to operate so as to inspire and focus rather than divide popular organizing. This inspi inspiration and focus must aid rather than oppose popular unity formulated along lines of cultural consciousness, and since it is precisely the unity of colonized peoples that conditions an overturning of imperialism in these colonies. Um, at the conclusion of this discourse on colonialism, he asserts that the salvation of Europe depends upon the universal mission of the proletariat, sort of a counterintuitive assertion after the rest of the essay. Uh, this success itself depends on solidarity between the working classes and rural colonized peoples, since all, alongside industrial production, there is what Césaire terms the factory of the production of lackeys at work in the colonies. Just as Luxembourg articulates the internal contradictions of capital that create imperialism, whereby capital increasingly employs militarism for implementing a foreign and colonial policy to get hold of the means of production and labor power of non-capitalist countries and societies, Césaire describes the parallel movement of imperialism's ideological and practical degradation of colonized peoples, an ideology and practice that displays a boomerang effect with the rise of fascism in Europe. In the name of solidarity, Césaire asserts the need for European proletarian policy of nationalities founded on the respect for peoples and cultures, while Luxembourg presciently reminds us that although international socialism recognizes the right of independent nations with equal rights, uh, socialism alone can create such nations. For in the context of the, the capitalist totality, imperialistic world policies determine and, and regulate the inner and outer life of the nation. So we have, you know, these two things going together here. You know, you need one before the other, obviously. Um, or you need both in order to satisfy the other. Solidarity and autonomy are as distinct as they are inex inextricable. The importance of autonomy, among other things, may explain why Luxembourg never proposed policy to colonize peoples, though she persistently referred to imperialism to motivate socialist struggle. Um, let's see here, so I, I think I have enough time for the rest of it, actually. Uh, all of this returns us to where we left the debate between Bolshevism and Luxembourg. What would seem to then be the danger of Bolshevism, one which undoubtedly resonates in hindsight, is the, that socialist revolutionary leadership come to mistake itself for the general socialist revolutionary consciousness, whether among urban workers or any other exploited class. This danger should by no means paralyze social struggle since, as Luxembourg reminds us in Social Reform or Revolution, the proletariat is absolutely obliged to seize power too early once or several times before it can enduringly maintain itself in power. It's for this reason that we must not seek to validate or for that matter demonize one particular form of socialist revolutionary organization, whether in control of the state or not, we must of course historicize. As Luxembourg also points out in the same passage, the transition to socialist society will not begin with one act. Against Lukács, who in defense of Lenin's brand of orthodoxy claims Luxembourg overvalues mass sponsor spontaneity and undervalues party organization, we must take seriously her writing on mass strikes. It is important to clarify the relationship between Luxembourg's discussion of strikes and the publication of the accumulation of capital. Uh, from the perspective of her biogra uh, biographer, J.P. Nettle, after the Russian uh, Revolution of 1905, uh, Luxembourg's conception of the role of the party moved towards considering organization a potential hindrance, all of uh, which he believed uh, the revolution demonstrated could be brought back into dynamism when co uh, confronted by enthusiastic mass action. According to the view I've sought to articulate, um, this is actually referring to a part I didn't read, um, what should be of particular interest today is Nettle's claim that Luxembourg's preoccupation with imperialism arose directly out of the mass strike discussion. It already, uh, it's already been seen how Luxembourg's analysis of imperialism arrives at a conception of the concrete totality, passing from the practical concern with militarism to the theory that emerges out of her research on slavery and the dissolution of primitive communism. Uh, 
to you know, the, the uh, formalization and the accumulation of capital thereafter. Uh, this work arrives amid an internal struggle in social democracy to withstand the bourgeois imperialist influence of opportunism by putting to use Marx's once rusted, rep once rusted weaponry. Imperialism is precisely the capitalist totality in its militaristic destruction of non-capitalist social strata at home as, a br as, well, as well as abroad. Though it may not have been initially framed in these terms, it's the, ma the mass strike that appears in Luxembourg as the proletarian counterforce to this immobilization and to imperialism as such. Uh, nonetheless, Luxembourg insisted that if anyone to undertake to make the mass strike generally as a form of proletarian action the object of methodical agitation, it would be as much of a waste of effort as to reify any other form of revolution and proselytize them. What's to be propagandized is not a strategic analysis of the tactical form, but the historical contexts of intensifying class struggle which have informed it. The mass strike has now become the center of the lively interest of the German and international working class because it is a new form of struggle and as such is the sure symptom of the thoroughgoing internal revolution in the relations of the classes and in conditions of class struggle. Luxembourg, uh, oh yeah, uh, mass strikes make possible an awakening of class feeling and consciousness because they are themselves a spectacular expression of it. In them, undercurrents of the social processes of the revolution cross one another, check one another, and increase the internal contradictions of the revolution. The most lasting repercussion of the mass wave is not a particular form of action, but an enlivening intellectualization of the necessity and conditions of action, a consciousness that lays the, ba the basis for further economic and political struggle. Contrary to accusations of economism, Luxembourg's argument is that the political mass actions that emerge from socialist revolutionary consciousness dissolve after their, their pinnacle into a mass of economic strikes that the refinement of political struggle effectuates a uh, further spread and formalization of the, of the economic struggle. Um, to quote her, the economic struggle is the transmitter from one political center to another. The political struggle is the periodic fertilization of the soil of economic struggle. The theory of the mass strike is that it in practice effectuates a consciousness amenable to dialectical materialism insofar as the reciprocal action of the economic and the political is precisely what it displays. For scientific socialism to be efficacious, Marxists must work within the class struggle to support the formation of class consciousness in and through mass action by themselves taking principled and consistent action. For it is our project to inspire in the masses a feeling of security, self-confidence, and desire for struggle. The basis of this action must, of course, be our knowledge of the concrete totality of capitalism and the dialectic of solidarity and autonomy this knowledge demands in the faces of imperialism. The accumulation of capital is a crucial weapon in our struggle, for it elaborates to us the conditions that have made necessary a commitment to internationalist and anti-imperialist struggle. Just as it emerges throughout, uh, thoroughly rather, out of the historical conditions it analyzes, so too does it remind us that our work today demands an orthodoxy based in the international intensification of the class struggle. Not only the lengths capital goes to avoid its ever gaping grave, but to those mass actions of all exploited the dig it. Thank you. Also exactly